Yeah, we prayed double, that was good. <laughs> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, for the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit, Granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. St. Joseph. Pray for us. Paul and Terry. Pray for us. St. Ignatius. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. And may follow us on those. We'd like to welcome you all to our Ignatian Forum. And as is our custom, we've got Father Craig with mm. us on Mondays mm. as our guest. And we have Mary, as always. Mm. Mm. Um, Mm. I'd like to jump into the theme right away. Last, uh, yesterday we celebrated uh, Good Shepherd Sunday. Very beautiful, beautiful topic. And um, we had the, uh, the Gospel of St. John, Chapter 10. And today we have a follow-up of the Good Shepherd. And um, the Good Shepherd. Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And uh, we're the... We're his flock. He is the good shepherd. We, we're his flock. And um, my thought, and it was part of my homily I gave uh, a few minutes ago in the 12 o'clock Mass, is that Jesus is the good shepherd, but in a certain sense, um, in a very real sense, I think we're all called to be, to live out this being a good shepherd in one way or another. And in the church, I think it's the most obvious that Jesus is the Good Shepherd and the, uh, the Holy Father, he's a vicar of Christ. Uh, Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. So constantly we have to be praying for the Pope. Okay, that has to be a constant. You know, we have been, you have been praying for the Pope every day for at least 30 years. Hmm. And me, I've been praying for the Pope every day, at least for the past 35 years, because every time we say the Mass, mm -hmm. we're praying for the Pope. True. And that's a very important intention, to pray for the Pope. Mm -hmm. And then, we should be praying for the bishops. Uh, praying for all the bishops, but especially uh, our, um, our Archbishop and our regional bishops, and by the way, our bishop will be coming tonight actually to confirm some of our young people. No? That's right. And he'll be coming tomorrow also. So um, we want to be praying for praying for our bishops that they'll be able to, you know, follow the footsteps of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And um, I would say especially to pray for our diocese and the many fl the many sheep. About five years ago, when I went to um, the presbyteral meeting, which uh, was in September, this must have been about five years ago. You were probably there also. Um, there was a man who came from New York, and he was talking about the importance of leadership. And we as priests were called to be shepherds. One point he made is never never left me said that uh, L.A., Los Angeles, is, is the biggest diocese in the country. But he went on to say that L.A. is possibly the most important diocese in the world. Hmm. And the reason why he said is because New York and L.A. are the, the centers of communication in the world, you know, Hollywood and all these. Hmm. So because of that, even though you might have a a diocese that might be bigger, like the city of Mexico or, or San Pablo, pa Paulo, might be bigger with respect to numbers. But the possibility of influence because of the electronics media, this is a, this is a, mm -hmm. a really powerful uh, means by which evangelization can come out. And you have so many immigrants coming and going. So um, I think we have to interpret the Good Shepherd and the 
in the eyes of a, um, a bishop in the, his diocese. On a more local level, how about, how about a parish? Here we have, right now, we have six priests with us. We've got Father Ed Delaney, Father Larry, Father Dave Keeter, myself, Father Craig, and Father Dave. So we've got six priests here. And we're called to be shepherds. Are we good? I think we're aiming at it. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we could be better. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm the first one to admit it. No? Mm -hmm. I think we're all aiming at trying to become good shepherds to, um, to our flocks. And this morning when I was praying, I was thinking, what are the different flocks that God has placed in your, in your hand? And this, this was the thought that occurred to me. Mm -hmm. um, for you, it would be the McMahon family and the Broome family. Mm -hmm. Like your, I see it this way, your brother, your sister, your father, and your, uh, your nephew, Spencer, your nieces, and I've got 39, pretty big, pretty big family. It's kind of a flock, and I think we should be praying for them. Then let's think about the Oblate family, mm. praying for all the Oblates throughout the world. Mm. Then let's think about the local Oblate family here, that's... That, that, that's a flock, too. Mm. And I think about St. Peter Chanel. That's a flock. In your case, <clears throat> the RCA groups, in a certain mm. sense, you're shepherding them. And the confirmation kids have been working with them, with your help also, the past, mm. for the past three months. I see that as a flock to tend. Then even this, um, over the past year, we've been working by live streaming, so we've got a live stream family too. Mm. And um, and also, you know, the people that come to us for direction or confession, they see that as another mini flock. So, um, kind of kind of gel today that we have a lot of flocks, mm. and to place them on the altar so that when all is said and done, we don't want them to to be seduced or lured by the wolf. Or rather, we want them to end up in the in the arms of the Good Shepherd. All these people that I mentioned, long life, short life, doesn't really matter. Health mm -hmm. or sickness, yeah, we all have our ailments, no? Riches or poverty, money comes and goes. Honors, mm -hmm. humiliations. Mm -hmm. We're famous today and <laughs> within a, a generation. I don't know even who you, even, even who you are, right? What's important is that's that's Prince Monk Foundation, right? Holy indifference. So um, I really like the idea of the Good Shepherd and giving a much more extensive interpretation to it. Even in the family, parents, right? Mm -hmm. Parents are called to be shepherds. Yes, they're called to be good shepherds. Would you agree with that? True. Yeah, they're yeah. called to be good shepherds, and. Um, as we, we mentioned in uh, the, uh, the Holy Hour you used in your homily the other day, I was saying, you know, a good way to be a good shepherd is first, to be a good shepherd of the sheep, you have to be a good sheep of the shepherd, mm -hmm. of the good shepherd. And to pray for your sheep and then try to give good example, give, a, give good advice. So those, those are the three or four points I mm -hmm. highlighted in our, mm -hmm. our, our Holy Hour. And I think you, you developed that in your homily mm -hmm. the other day. Pretty simple, but, you know, to the point, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, and even older brothers, I was mentioning at the table, older brothers and sisters are called mm -hmm. to be good shepherds to the younger siblings. Mm -hmm. I was right. telling um, Father Larry that in parenting skills, if you're going to have five kids, make sure that you form number one and two well, because the other are going to be watching the way the older siblings behave. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a, an introduction to the first reading today, which is John chapter 10 which is kind of a follow-up of yesterday. I think that the church wants us to focus and meditate more upon being a good shepherd. Mm -hmm. So there we have, um, we think we kind of set the, the groundwork for uh, our, uh, our conversation today. And we can maybe go into the first reading too, which is fascinating too in the Acts of the Apostles. No? Mm -hmm. Any comments? Well, yes, it is uh, fundamentally important to to recognize that Jesus is a good shepherd and then to also participate in, in that role of good shepherding. In my homily yesterday I said that Jesus the good shepherd has 
gone out of our sight, so we can't see them anymore physically. We could see the, the Eucharist, but we don't really see the Jesus speaking to us and hear him speaking to us. So he left that visibility of shepherding to us. Good Obviously, point. Yeah. you know, to the, as you said, the we Pope. Have to incarnate him in a certain sense. Yeah, state. that's right. Yep. So we have to be that, carry on that good shepherd role for, for each other and for the world. And uh, obviously we've got the, the ones in the church who are uh, in, higher up in the hierarchy who are doing that, or that is their role to do. And then, uh, you know, got the priests and deacons. And, um, but yes, really, it's, it's all of us, like, as you so, said so well, that uh, parents and even older siblings mm -hmm. for younger siblings. So really, there's, there's no one that doesn't have some sheep entrusted to him mm -hmm. <laughs> or her. And so we need to uh, be good shepherds. I even said good shepherdesses for <laughs> for the women. <laughs> and I said that my mother was a, a good shepherdess for me. You know, yeah. she helped me uh, in my specifically in my uh, life in my journey towards my vocation. So that uh, you know that reality of being a good shepherd is really important because before even uh, someone gets to the seminary, there's been some good shepherding going on before then. Mm -hmm. As you can well attest in your own family, like you said, your, your older brother yeah. was a little bit of a shepherd to you. Yes. Yeah. Even though he's only one year older than you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what happened is, um, is this. Um, when, when I was in uh, junior high and high school, uh, I'm sure different than you because um, you probably were madly in love with books ever since you're in first grade. I mean, <laughs> you hated the weekends, and once Monday came, you were just rejoicing for the next five days. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I, 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 you know, I, 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 really, I really didn't like school that much, even though I, I, I got good grades. Mm. Uh, I, I got good grades, but I didn't like, I didn't like, I didn't like school. Mm. And... Um, <laughs> But look at it. Being a big family, I never had my own room, mm. except the the last year at home, because I always shared a room with Mike. Mm. So if you got all these siblings following, even though you got four rooms, so you end up with nine kids, seven, eight, nine kids. Mm. You're not gonna have your own room. We never complain. We'd have bunk beds, mm -hmm. and we we share. I, I like to be on the bottom, and, and we all like to be on the bottom because you're top. You didn't have the guardrail, sometimes you'd fall off. Hmm. And it sounded like a minor atomic bomb. No? <laughs> <laughs> but um, th this, is, this is what would happen. He was just well, very well disciplined. He'd finish his school, he'd have his paper route, uh, and then when he was like a junior, his part time job. So school till 310, come back. Paper out in an hour, and by like 4.30 until 6.30, in the room studying, dinner half an hour, studying another two hours. He would have a honey toast about 8.30, that was his little treat. Mm. And if he's there in, his, he's there in the room, studying all the time, I'm just sitting around playing tic-tac-toe, it just wouldn't cut. <laughs> so that was a stimulus for me while well, he's, he's, yeah. he's studying. I mean, I, I should probably yeah. be doing it also. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a good example. Yeah, sure. Not that he said anything, but it's a good example. And I'm, yeah. it's interesting how, looking retrospect, you're not aware of the good, the good example until yeah. you're, you know, you're looking back 50 yeah. years later. Yes. That, was, that was pretty good. No? You probably realize that not every uh, brother is like... No, your brother. <laughs> but the other two, the, the yeah. other two that followed us, they were, they were okay, but they were not not as studious as both of us. Mm -hmm. but, um, so, um, mm. and I, I would I would attribute that to my parents. And the parents uh, mm. wanted him to, you know, wanted to perform mm. well. No? Wow, yeah. <laughs> and he set a good uh, tone for the, all the rest of the siblings. Yeah. yeah. And, and given that we we had a good rapport with the younger ones. My mom and dad would be able to go out every two or three weeks and go out to restaurant or dancing or maybe seeing films because they believed that they got to, they had to really fortify their own union. And I remember they would come home, they were always joking around and bantering and, and as long as mom and dad said, okay, you, you have to watch your siblings and we'll give you, we'll give you ice cream. <laughs> now these are the years where you did ice cream was a real treat, no? <laughs> and have some ice cream cookies and you can watch Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> 
<laughs> the open window, huh? <laughs> Maybe here Al Alfred Hitchcock was kind of oh, like a scary, scary, very suspenseful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always with some unexpected twists. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like the Twilight Zone. Yeah, you ever hear the one, the Twilight Zone? There was a story of this person that had like an earwig mm. that that earwig that got in the ear and mm. cut all the way from one ear to the other ear. Ooh. <laughs> And uh, the person didn't die. Huh. But then you know what happened? Huh. They said the earwig came, went from one ear out to the other, didn't die. But it was a female and it laid eggs. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Very horrifying, yeah. <laughs> like a horror Body camp, right? <laughs> <laughs> that really stuck in your mind, didn't yes. it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, mm. Mary, what do you think about being a good shepherd? Are you a good shepherd to your sheep? You have a lot of sheep in your, in your flock, don't you, Mary? I hope so. You're trying? I hope so. I try. I pray for them. I know I pray for them. That's probably the best thing I can do for them is pray for them. Yes. Um, yes. So um, it's interesting how when you look at all the different ways that we're, we're, she we're shepherds, and uh, something that um, kind of came up the other day in, in the forum, and so I've been thinking about it a lot, is we're we're supposed to be good shepherds to people we don't even know people that that we to see us that we that see us in the grocery store or at the doctor's office the or a guy right yes <laughs> yes yes yes, <laughs> yes. because um, we're setting an example we should be setting an example at all times and so in a way we're shepherding people that we don't even know wherever we go if we're if we're if we have a Christian um, friendliness a Christian um, gentleness, a Christian patience, a Christian kindness, um, we're, we're exhibiting those virtues, then we're, we're shepherding people, we're touching lives that we're not even aware of. And, and I think that's a beautiful thought. It's a beautiful thought, an inspiring thought to, to, you know, always, I mean, our Christianity, we should live it at all times. You know, it's not, it's not a face mask you put on and take off, hopefully. <laughs> so um, that, that thought occurred to me when you were talking and, um, Thinking about you know my own family and uh, you know my good parents and my good older brothers and sisters and um, just all the ways I've been blessed with really good examples of good Catholic Christian living and loving. So I, I feel very very blessed. I really had a had a very very good family. So um, yeah, and then and then here at the parish, there's lots of opportunities. All there's many of us here who contribute in so many ways. There's people here contributing hours um, behind the scenes and actually used to do teaching or behind the scenes preparing. Uh, so many people here are involved in being good shepherds. You know, for the people that come to us to learn about the faith, to know the faith, to grow in the faith, and uh, so um, this is this is a really active parish, and everyone that comes here. Um, they're always so amazed how much is going on here, even even in during COVID, yeah. you know, and so many avenues that the priests are reaching out, and then and then we're help, you know, we try lay people try and help we help the re the reaching out, but um, and how many people are involved, and uh, it's just a bit, it's like a it's like a busy beehive, you know, with a lot of activity and a lot of busy bees and a lot going on, and uh, so but it, it's all you're shepherding, it's always shepherding. Um, and of course, what you said, Father, to be a good sheep, we have to be, to be a good shepherd, we have to be a good sheep to the good shepherd, mm -hmm. one to our shepherds, to the priests, because you mm -hmm. speak for Christ for us, and then, but then to, um, to Christ himself. And one of the things that um, the sheep, Jesus said, the sheep know, know me, and they know my voice, and they follow me. So we, we, in our prayer life, we learn to hear his voice, but we also, we need to, we need to be good sheep to Christ. We need to um, be docile, and that that docility is the key to sanctity. You know, just just being docile to Christ, to God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to the events in our life, to the um, uh, to be docile to to God in all things. And that is that is the, so many of the saints they were just docile to whatever God said or wanted or allowed to happen. Right. So it's really it's all encompassing. So um, there's a lot in this. It's just it's just all encompassing. Father Larry, over the past couple of days, he's been sharing a book that he's reading. And he's reading a book uh, by Father Thomas Dubé, and it's, the name of the book is Authenticity. And he's giving some points um, in the chapters on um, 
authenticity in the essence of the book authenticity is that these saints they were the real deal they really followed Christ fully and totally and I was thinking about that this morning authenticity the opposite of that would be um, I used a, an Argentinian proverb the other day the Argentinians say escribir con la mano borrar con el codo which means to uh, to, to write with your write with your hand your fingers, but then to erase erase with your elbows. They so say, for example, you're writing on a whiteboard, you write with these fingers, and then you're you're erasing with your elbow. Mm -hmm. And what really what it means is, you say something with your lips, but you're contradicting it with your life. Mm -hmm. Authenticity is what you say, is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Went on to say that Jesus began Jesus began by doing, and then mm -hmm. uh, by preaching. Jesus would do, and then he would preach. And um, uh, three, three ideas came to me that followed from this. Uh, Vatican II, I think as God in its best, says that one of the biggest scandals in the world is the dichotomy between what Christians say and they do, or the separation between the way they're speaking but the, the way they're really not living. Then uh, two other ideas occurred to me. Mahatma Gandhi was admired by many people for his efforts uh, to establish peace, kind of like a, a Martin Luther King of India. Um, what I'm going to say is pretty strong, but he said it. He said that, uh, I love Jesus Christ, but Christians stink. <laughs> and he said that it would be really great if people would live the gospel, especially the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. That's always been kind of um, uh, painful to recall the words of this great man. People, people admire this man for his, his authenticity in seeking peace. Then, do um, you ever hear the story of the, the child atheist? Can I tell you? Yes. Yes. This one I got from Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen said that there was a child atheist and there was an adult that was trying to dig to the roots of why this child was an atheist. And this is what the child said. Well, this is my reasoning. Very intellectual child, using logic and reason. If, um, if a plant can create another plant, if a tree can create another tree, if a caterpillar or an ant or worm can create another ant or worm, if a cat can create another cat, if a dog can create another dog, I would think that Jesus would be able to create other Jesuses and they haven't seen one yet. In other words, if Jesus is Jesus, there should be replicas of Jesus and this child has never been able to find someone. Oh, interesting. Very intellectual. Yeah, very intellectual. Yeah. Hmm. However, I would contradict the child mm -hmm. and say, you haven't read the lives of the saints. That's the book of Father Dubé, mm. is that the saints are the real deal. Mm. Coca-Cola, the real thing. Mm -hmm. They're the real deal. They are authentic. And uh, what was name? Colby said that the, the saints... They don't di dilute the gospel, or they try to water down the gospel, but the saints really try to live the gospel. So, um, I kind of like the story of that child atheist. There's mm -hmm. some wisdom in it, isn't it? No? No, that's true. What do you think? Well, yes, yes. Uh, there should be some copies of Jesus around. What? There should be some copies of Jesus around. We would like to be those copies ourselves. Replicas, huh? Replicas, there we go, <laughs> yes. That's the idea, you know, we're created in the image and likeness of God, and then we are to enter into the likeness of Jesus, too, through our baptism and the sacraments, through our following of Jesus. And, of course, we are all works in progress, and it could be some defects on the surface that people might not get beyond, you know, and they might think that disqualifies the person, but if they would follow them more closely, they might be seeing 
in a more hidden way that there are some good virtues there, mm -hmm. but they're uh, you know too um, quick to s dismiss them because of some failure of virtue you know that was very easy to see. So I guess uh, we're in that journey, and uh, if you want to see the uh, the perfect copies of Jesus, you have to go to heaven, right? <laughs> Got to go visit heaven and see the saints. Um, or, yeah, or, or read the lives of saints. That's so important. You know, reading uh, uh, well, the Gospels. Uh, in the Gospels, you really have saints, uh, you know, the future saints. They're being instructed. And you don't see them saints yet. But then when you go to other books in the New Testament, you see them in, as saints. You know, you see, uh, of course, the book of Revelation, you see a whole uh, armies of saints, you know, uncountable numbers, a multitude, or 144,000, you know, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. So you begin to see the saints in the other books of the New Testament, whereas the, uh, the, the three years that Jesus was doing his ministry, he's in the process of, you know, making, uh, laying the groundwork for that future sanctity. So we don't actually see it in the gospel so much. We do see it, except for Jesus himself, we do see it, you know. Um, and those the small glints we get of uh, Mary and Joseph, we do see sanctity there. But then we have to really go into the Acts of the Apostles and the letters of St. Paul and other letters in the book of Revelation to see those copies of Jesus that, that the little boy would want to see. Mm -hmm. So keep on reading. Don't stop with the gospel. Go, out, go beyond all the way to the Acts of the Apostles and then you start to see the saints. You know, sometimes people, simplistic people, they make... Um, in literature, it's called making sweeping generalizations mm -hmm. where they try to pigeonhole, uh, pigeonhole people into these little categories. And sometimes simplistic people will, will look at the church and uh, see see the defects in the church. For example, um, you know, since the year two thousand two, the, the scandals have come out. Come out. Um, uh, the the movie Spotlight, which started there in Boston, just seeing mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of limitations and defects, and uh, making sweeping generalizations. I think it's a sign of uh, intellectual shallowness. Or superficiality, mm -hmm. it's like saying all the all the Latinos are this way, all the black people this way, all the white people this way, all the Asian people this way. Maybe highlighting a defect and making a sweeping generalization, saying they're all that way. That, that's really it's ludicrous to the point of just being dumb, you know. Um, but people do make that. So to to expel that myth. Uh, I remember Fa Father Benedict Rochelle of Happy Memory. Uh, he once said this: what, "Whatever, whatever you say about the Catholic Church is going to be true, because if you got right now, I think is I think is about a billion point two Catholics at least baptized mm -hmm. in the world. About that, something like that. Sure. Uh, if you've got about a billion point two Catholics, and those who've gone before us would be." probably at least quadruple the number, if not more. Mm -hmm. uh, really, whatever, whatever you say about the members of the church is going to be true. You get, you get the best of the best, you got the worst of the worst. And sometimes I've said there's some people are condemning the church saying, you know, all the church people are bad, you know, the, the, you know, the people are hypocrites, and, and I'll say, well, if you want to come, there's 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 room for one more. No, I'll say sometimes. No. <laughs> <laughs> come and join us. <laughs> but I'll say here's here's six Catholics. Um, Father Greg Staub of Happy Memory, and when he came here, mm -hmm. he didn't know Spanish, so I was head of Spanish catechetical program. So I gave him a group of about. Um, maybe 15, 15 con, uh, First Communion boys, and they were the older ones, and Father Larry always pointed out, when, when they're coming in older, that means usually there's problems in the family. The fact that they're registering them at 11 or 12, 13, there's usually some family problem. And he had a rowdy group. And uh, 
following my line of reasoning now, three, three of the names, uh, you're not going to believe this, but it was true, three of the names of his students, one was, I'll say it in Spanish, Adolfo, and then another name was Lenin, and the other, the other was Stalin. Wow. <laughs> so in his class, he had Adolfo, Hitler, he had hmm. Stalin, Joseph Stalin, a Lenin, not John Lennon, but Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> mm -hmm. He had three of the the biggest monsters we had last century. No? Mm -hmm. Stalin killed 20 million, Hitler five to six million, and Lenin is basically uh, the one who started the, the, the um, from Das Kapital of Karl Marx. Marx, he developed the whole communist uh, party or, or uh, philosophy. So, in the church, I say you got here, here. Here's three. You got JP two. You got Mother Teresa. You got John Bosco. Whew. But then you got Hitler was Aust he was Austrian Catholic. Mm. Stalin was at least he was baptized Russian Orthodox. Mm. And um, Castro Castro his brother is still living. Raúl Castro. He was he was he was formed and um, he was raised by the Je he was formed by the Jesuits. There and, and so you got the best of the best, you got the worst of the worst. So um, mm. I say to people who are critical of the church, the best thing to do is not to criticize, but you become a saint. Mm. Pray, fast, do penance, work hard, support, love God, love your neighbor. Because by, criti by criticizing, you're just tearing down. Mm. Cheese me. Uh, you know, mm. by criticizing, you're not building up, you're, te you're tearing down. We're called to build up, right? Mm. So, um, I think that has to, it has to be said, well, we, we, can, um, we can build up. We're not called to tear down, but to build up. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yes, yes. So important, right? Because, yeah, you're always going to find negative, going to find sins and defects and horrors. <laughs> because uh, human beings have free will, and... Uh, Baptism doesn't remove the free will. The weed and the tear, right? The weed and the yeah, cockle. You can get right. that in the field, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah, and if we, and the higher we are, the more we can fall. You know, the, the farther we can fall, let's say. So if someone is really up there in terms of virtue, and they fall, that's a big fall indeed. Yeah. You know, so, uh, or at least in God's eyes, it is. I mean, it could be that that person thinks, well, I'm not so bad as other people have done terrible things, but... It might be worse in God's eyes the fact that they they fell even a little bit, you know, you know, in the eyes of the world maybe not so terribly, but in uh, in God's eyes it might be a terrible betrayal, you know. So things are kind of relative too. There, to you know, our human eyes are not always the best to evaluate and to, and to judge things because only God knows how much grace someone was given, and and therefore. Their infidelity to grace could be very great, whereas someone else who did something terrible didn't have much grace at all, you know, could be more leniently judged by God. Mm -hmm. So there's that. But Jesus says, he who has much also has to, the, render, the rendering of account is going to be much more serious. He who has yeah, the right. five talents is going to be judged more severely the person has one talent, right? That's so true, yeah. So I guess it means none of us can really say, well, at least I'm not like that. You know, because <laughs> I'm, not that bad. I'm not that bad, because each one of us is expected to be a little bit better, let's say, than than the people that we're pointing at that didn't have that much mm -hmm. grace or opportunity for learning and doing as we did. You know, mm -hmm. so it's um, a very different perspective, God's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah. Mary, any any thoughts on this topic? It's a very engaging topic, mm -hmm. isn't it? It yeah. is. It is. Um, I think the only safe thing to say is we're all sinners, and God came to save sinners, and that's our, that's our that's where our goodness lies is that we we accept His grace, we accept His forgiveness and His grace, and um, and then and then from that, but really the the queen of virtues is charity, yes. so that's where our charity comes from. I mean, how can I point one finger, point a finger at you? I've got four pointing back at me. Yeah, you know. So so the the, the basic the basic. <laughs> truth is that we're all sinners you know we, we we know we're all sinners that's that's the that's that's what gives us freedom to um to 
to repent, to keep repenting, going to confession and repenting and receiving God's grace to try and be a little better each, each day, but also then to embrace our brother and sister, no matter who they are or where they are or where they're coming from, because we're all sinners. We're all in the same boat, and Christ is, is going to um, steer that boat to heaven if we'll just cooperate with the graces that he gives us in his church. And then the people that don't have the graces of the church, um, you know, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And I've always wondered, and maybe maybe theologically you've studied and know if this is true or not, that um, all humans are his sheep, but they're not they're not of they're not of the, his fold in the terms of, of 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 our of our Catholic faith. But they're all they're all his sheep and he's drawing, trying to draw each of them to him. And some will come to him but not not through the church. The church even says that in the catechism, there's others that will come to him. But not through the church. But but the church is the way to 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 receive the most graces and the most um, the most um, uh, to benefit others most is through the church. We can we, we benefit ourselves and others by by our Catholic faith and practicing it. And so that's where that's where we want to bring everyone to the church. But there's others. He has other sheep that are not of this not of this fold, and and he's he'll bring them to him too. So. Um, I, th- I think being a, just saying we're all sinners and recognizing we're all sinners and then don't expect anything from anyone because I've done that too, all right? Whatever you've done, if I haven't done that, I've done something else, okay? That you haven't done. So just we're all sinners, but we're all forgiven and we're all capable of... So then ultimately, what does that lead to? Charity. Charity is the queen of the, of the virtues. Where charity is we're all, we all embrace each other, accept each other, work with each other, try and help each other, lift each other up when we fall. So charity covers a multitude of sins and it and because we're all sinners then we all need charity and um building upon that one of the verses i've always loved most in sacred scripture and it's very encouraging is that love covers a multitude of sins i've always loved that verse mm. isn't that encouraging beautiful yeah love covers a multitude of sins. Yes. And even though we have committed many sins, uh, if we love much, like Jesus said to the sinner, she's been forgiven much because she's loved much. Mm. As you're pointing out, when all is said and done, um, our, our judgment is going to be, do we die with grace, which means die with charity? And if the, the charity is intense, who, who, who's going to go to purgatory when, when, when our love is not perfect? That, lo- that love, if it's not perfect, has to be purified in the fire of God's divine love. Mm. But um, we always have the chance, until we die, to love God, the great Shema, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. God is always there with His arms open, but sometimes we don't want to throw ourselves in the arms of a loving God. Sometimes we prefer some type of false God, which is the es- essence of idolatry, is we put any person, place, or thing above above the authentic love of God. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. Yes. So the love of God, that's the key, you know. And someone could be working on that and, you know, maybe some external aspects of our life are not in keeping with it, but, uh, but they're on that road of love. And so that's someone going in a very positive direction, whereas someone else might have their externalize more in order but then uh, they're not really so strong in that love and they're going to get passed up by the other one you know <laughs> along the way you know about two weeks ago you uh you you gave a homily maybe a little bit less than two weeks but um i think sometimes the love is is thwarted because we were hurt and we we can sometimes be clinging on to past resentments. As that spiritual director gave to that Dave seminarian, he gave really good advice. He said, okay, look, that drunk driver, he, he smashed your car and he, he was mm-hmm. undocumented, so you, you, you can't get any, any money back and you can't get it restored. And he was angry. And the priest said, look, this is the prayer you have to say. God bless him and change my heart. No, it should be the other way around, no? God bless me and change his heart. <laughs> I think sometimes in, um, sometimes in 
an unknown way, people's love are blocked because they're hurt and they're really not really ready to forgive. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You yeah, that, that can block us for sure. Because God says, Jesus told us that if we don't forgive others, then God can't forgive us either. The Our Father, right? Isn't well, it the Our Father forgive us? Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's in the Our Father, right? So, there you have it. You're, you're really blocked if you're not forgiving someone. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to forgive, you know. It, it, we say to, to err is human, to forgive is divine, you know. So it's really, it's a, it brings us to a new level of being able to, uh, if we can forgive others. And we have to tap into God's own power to do that. Um, but it is possible. And God makes that power available to us, the power to forgive. Mm -hmm. Like in the prayer that uh, the seminary and Dave said, uh, bless him and change me. Eventually God did change him. And, and you know, after about three months of praying that prayer, he was actually, it will be at peace about what had happened and, he really did forgive the man who had, uh, you know, totaled his car and, and, and was not able to make restitution. So, yes, we need to get, to get there, and it's a journey, but God can get us there, and uh, we don't, we, we sometimes get confused and think we have to feel like we've forgiven the person in order to forgive them. We may not feel like we've forgiven them because we may still feel angry, um, but if we're making the decision to forgive, then we are forgiving them. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the feeling will follow. I have sometimes given an example of a, of a shepherd and sheep. You know, the shepherd leads the way, and eventually the sheep will follow, even if they're a little bit distracted, they'll eventually will follow the shepherd where he's going, hopefully. And I say that the, the, the sheep are like our emotions, and the shepherd is like our will. Mm -hmm. So when the will says, I forgive him, and goes in the direction of forgiveness, the sheep that are, you know, not necessarily following the shepherd so well, but they see him kind of disappearing in the distance, they start running after him, you know. So in other words, the feelings are going to follow the choice of your will, and you're actually going to enjoy the feeling of having forgiven. But that's going to, you know, take a little while to do. So just keep walking forward as the shepherd, that is, as your, your will, forgiving the other person. Mm -hmm. And yes, that, that certainly is one area where you get blocked, yeah. is uh, not forgiving. But if we're on that journey of trying to forgive, then we're going the right direction. It may take a while to get there, but we're on the, on the right path. Is there any, um, obviously our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the model of the Good Shepherd. Is there any, maybe in your life, um, could be maybe some, some saint or, mm -hmm. that really has captivated, really you, you um, admire as... Uh, is a good shepherd of the sheep? Hmm. Well, my, I was when I was growing up, my brother went to the Salesians. Okay. And he would bring back stories. He was in the minor seminary in high school, but he'd bring back all kinds of stories about St. John Bosco. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that was a great shepherd right there. <laughs> you know, just really the, the, the sheep, the children, the boys followed him. And uh, it was always wonderful to hear the stories about him and, and about his dreams. So he was an obviously excellent shepherd, you know. Although when he was younger, he, at least in one of his dreams, he was beating up the kids that were, uh, you know, not, they were maybe blaspheming or something. Uh, and then Our Lady appeared to him in the dream, so that's not the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he needed to, to learn to how to do that, you know, even in his dream. Um, and, and learn he did, you know, he was a very good student. And, uh, and so being a good shepherd of uh, of the lord he became or rather good sheep of the lord he became a good shepherd too mm -hmm. he had real leader amazing leadership ability you know yes. what gifts of leadership he had so he's just a splendid example and um you know it's very easy to look at him and admire him then you have other saints that are much more hidden and in uh, that saint you're, you know who i'm thinking of uh, St. Peter Chanel, Father Lanteri? Father Lanteri. Father Lanteri, yes. <laughs> Father Lanteri is a very hidden saint. Uh, he's just working behind the scenes. He, he knows a lot of important people in society, as well as uh, poor people. So he has kind of a, a, a wide circle of, of acquaintance, uh, you know. But uh, he's, with the important people, he's, he's trying to lead them in, in, in the right direction and get them to come closer to the church, closer to Christ, closer to the sacraments. And he did a lot of influencing of, of the 
society, kind of one person at a time, uh, of the, the more influential people. And so, but he's, he's always behind the scenes. So he's, not, he's not known by, uh, you know, like St. John Bosco is known. But what's interesting, and most people don't know, is that uh, as a young priest, St. John Bosco went to a school that Father Lanteri had a, a, a hand in forming. It was called the Convito Ecclesiastico. It was basically a school for young priests so they could uh, learn moral theology and become confessors. Because when you're ordained, you could celebrate the Mass, but you couldn't yet hear confessions. You had to do a little more moral theology after ordination in order to be accredited as a, as a confessor. So they had this school, but um, Father Lanteri's idea for the school was that it should also form the young priests into being good apostles. So Father John Bosco was in that school. And as such, even though um, there were no oblates running the school, but the oblates were well known there, the, the, the newly founded oblates. And it was known that uh, as, as of the late 1830s, uh, the oblates had gone to, to uh, Burma, which now is called Myanmar, which has had its unrest. And, um, and uh, they were missionaries and, and really bringing the faith for the first time. Well, the, the Barnabites had been there, and then they had to withdraw, and then the, then the oblates went there in the late 1830s, 40s, and 50s. And, um, and so this young priest, John Bosco, had this goal to be a, a missionary. He said, I know, I'll, go, I'll become an oblate, and I'll go to Burma. So he wanted to do that. He talked to a spiritual director, who is uh, Father Joseph Cafaso, who is working in the, in the Convito Ecclesiastico. And, and he said, I think God has another mission for you. So he had a special illumination that God had something special for him, to, not far away, but right there in the city of Turin. You know, maybe he already saw that he had some, some ability to work with young people or something. But he also had, was, had an illumination by God to give good spiritual direction to this young priest, to tell him, no, you stay here. And how important that was. We know the results of that. It is the, the Salesian congregation, all the fantastic work that John Bosco did. But it's interesting that he would have uh, looked to the oblates, wanted to become an oblate, you know, found, founded by this hidden figure called Venerable Bruno Lanteri. You know? So it's kind of interesting. You've got some saints that are really out there in the light. Others are kind of behind the scenes. But they're all important. You know? They're all fulfilling part of God's plan. Another example of that would be uh, the Florentine saint that spent most of his life in Rome, and his name was Philip Mary. Mm, yes. St. Philip Mary, we're going to be celebrating mm. his feast day on May 26th, actually, mm. you know, a month from today. Oh, yes. he, um, he, became, he was ordained a little bit in, in, in his late 30s, and he, uh, he felt that he wanted to become a missionary to go to the Far East, and he spoke with the Pope, and the Pope says, your Far East, your India, actually has to be Rome. Mm. And this, he's living at the same time as St. Ignatius Loyola, Charles Borromeo, um, uh, as well as... Um, Teresa? Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross and Pius V. There's a cluster of saints. And uh, the Pope said, no, your, your, um, your India has to be Rome. And uh, what I've read on... Life of Philip Mary. Rome was really, Rome was just spiritually a disaster, and this man did so much good. He would have been the John Bosco mm. of the um, 15, 1600 because he had a real, real charisma for the young people. Mm. He was joyful, and uh, one of the things he would do was he would be visiting the uh, the churches of Rome, and we'd take a whole, a big group of young people. Uh, like a picnic, they would go to uh, a church. They pray, and then they picnic, and then they'd have a lot of fun, and they joke around, and and this was this was way before John Bosco, but he he was known as the second apostle of Rome because mm -hmm. he did so much so much good, and um, mm -hmm. you know one of the experiences that he had as we get closer to Pentecost, is that he was in one of the catacombs praying for many days. According to what I read, he was praying and there was this fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit came down, entered in his mouth, and then his heart beat so strong that they said when he died they could actually see his, his rib cage had actually 
enlarged because of the beating of his heart. And young people, mm. when they're tempted, they place their heart, their head against the heart, and their temptation would disappear. They mm. said that they could actually hear the throbbing from a, a throbbing about a block away because the throbbing mm. of his heart, his love for for God, was so strong. Mm. So he's a. I admire him as a, as a shepherd too. Wow, you know, that's amazing! Shepherd, yeah. Saint Philip Mary, John Bosco. Yeah, you're right. He's the kind of forerunner of John Bosco. You're right because he founded the oratory, right, for for the young people, and then John Bosco formed an oratory for young people too. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wow. Mary, do you have any um, any um, good shepherd uh, model or leader that you really kind of captivates you? I um, because of the century I grew up in, I'd have to say John Paul II. Yeah. As a, you know, I think Why do you admire him? <laughs> so many reasons, but what a great man and a great pope and um, great visionary. Uh, he was involved in world politics and, and actually changed the course of history. Uh, so, um, but he loved the he loved the youth. He loved the youth, and he reached out to the youth and traveled all over the world. So world he was just World Youth Day. He was. Um, on so many levels, he was influential in our century. I mean, I don't. I, one man on so many levels being so influential is so. I think he's he's a superstar, and I think centuries forward they'll look back and see this superstar, you know, supernova, you know, in the sky. And it's John Boss. It's uh, John John Paul II. Um, even even to the point that we watched him age, and um, he we saw his infirmity. He showed us his infirmity. Who would do that? They would retire. They wouldn't want to be seen that way. Um, he was just, he was just uh, really a hero for me and, and a very inspiring. I wanted to say one comment, too, about forgiving people is um, something that I found that never has ever failed me is to pray for them. I just start praying for them. And um, serious prayer, I'll pray a rosary for them. If I need, I'll pray, too. But once I start praying for them, then God softens two hearts. He softens theirs, but he softens mine. It's never ever failed me, and so um, it's just it's just God's grace. It's it's so abundant. You know, um, but it, it, it's good also, as you said about uh, Dave, when you told the story in your uh, the Holy Hour. Then we talked about it in our forum. Uh, one of the things that struck me is that you said, I asked you um, how long, and I think you said three months. So really the healing process, it didn't happen overnight. And, yeah. I, and I think we really have to say that because it's like you get, uh, you get scars, and you get scars that, um, that are not healed right away. Sometimes it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more gaping the wound, the more uh, the more time it usually takes to heal. Mm -hmm. um, so, if we were to just say in kind of a a naive way, I, you know, I, I I like words and I like um, sometimes cliches can hit home. Um, for example. Let go and let God, I like that. It's really kind of abandonment. No? Mm -hmm. I've always liked that. But I've never, I don't know about your comment, I've never, never liked this one-liner. I, I think it's a lie. I think it's actually dangerous. Uh, is uh, for, to um, forgive and forget. I, I've never liked that at all. Mm. You know why we can forgive... But uh, th that Dave story, even though he's a priest now for thirty years, you said twenty. Oh, tw okay, twenty years. I don't. Well, the, the fact that he's preaching in it twenty years later, he hasn't forgotten it. Right, right. <laughs> he didn't forget. <laughs> so I think that we should tell tell our, our listeners, um, unless you have Alzheimer's or you have amnesia, uh, uh, I think we can all remember things that maybe happened fifty years ago. No, when you remember mm -hmm. running. You're running sure. some of your races, you, yes. or, or some some good thing happens, some bad. That it's we, our, our memories like archives, mm -hmm. and sometimes thoughts will surface after many many years. So, 
I'm glad that that was specified. Otherwise, you think, well, mm. this is a nice story. As long as I forgive within, you know, 48 hours, it's as if it's never going to happen. That's that's not life, is it? No. What do you think? That's quite true. You know. Um, yeah, like we say, our, our our memories are important. It, if we lose our memory, then we, we kind of lose our person, our personality. That's how it's when people are suffering from dementia or, yeah. or Alzheimer's. They, they've really lost their past and they don't really know who they are. So I think it is important that yeah, we remember. But it's just how do you remember? Do you remember it uh, with bitterness or do you remember it with a sense of uh, peacefulness and gratitude even? That, that God has enabled you to, to overcome that and to move on from there. So I think that... It's just how you remember. So maybe when they say forget, we'd have to correct that. Say, uh, forget your resentment. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you won't forget. Right, the, the, <laughs> you know, don't don't always uh, bring it back up to the other person because you, you want to remind them of how much they hurt you. That that would be kind of the sense. Probably forget. Don't bring it up again. You know, it's kind of vindictiveness, a certain the, yeah. revenge, right? Okay. Yeah, it's kind of a certain revenge, emotional revenge or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we do remember it in our memory, it's just we don't, we don't feel the need to bring it up again. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. the key. Yeah. Well, we're going to be saying the Chapel of Divine Mercy. Could you give our yes. listeners a nice blessing? Well, yes. Well, uh, by the intercession of all these inspiring saints, St. Philip Neri, St. John Bosco, St. John Paul II, and all the saints who knew how to forgive, how to become Christ to others, we ask God's blessing upon all our uh, live stream family here with us today and those who are not able to be here so that we all may grow in this holiness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.